I'm Jim Morgan. I'm the producing artistic director here at the York Theatre Company. And I'm Michael Montel. I'm a director here from time to time at the York Theatre Company. But not just any director. Um, you, first of all, you've survived your, your most recent production in the musicals in Mufti series. Uh, you have directed more Muftis than anyone in the history of the world, actually, <laughs> when you come down to it. Yeah, well, you send it to Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> That's an idea. We should do that. Your most recent show, um, which is quite an undertaking, yeah. is, is on now. We're on the set of it. Uh, you wouldn't know it to look at it at the moment, but... Um, it's fairly indistinguishable from the other 19 sets. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The stars are similar. Yes. Um, um, a Time for Singing. Right. And it's a gloriously beautiful show to listen to and to watch. A stunning cast. Um, it is a stunning cast. Uh, yes. An amazing group of people. And it's a stunning show that should be known. And it's, uh, I'm so proud that we're able to do it. Well, I'm, I'm, I now really feel tremendously proud at having been asked to do it and, and having done it. I mean, it, it is a, a rich discovery of a, of, a, of a Broadway show that really needed rediscovery. And it's, it's not just myself who I uh, feel sad. I mean, I, you've said you do, but the entire cast does. Uh, they, they really just totally pour themselves into it. And every one of the performances I've seen before, which is almost the, the usual Mufti run, which would have been over in the olden days uh, last year, uh, they're <coughs> so complete, they're so uh, connected to, to every, every heartbeat of the music. Totally. And passionate. They're, passionate. The, uh, happily, that has been the case in almost of, with almost every Mufti that we've done. The, the, the cast just sort of bands together because there's this pressure of making it happen in a very short amount of time. And they come to bond wonderfully with each other and with the material. There's something about this process. Now this new longer schedule that we have started, this is the second show we've done it on, um, seems to be working wonderfully. The whole idea is to be able to run them longer, to allow the cast to get a little more comfortable with the material and get more visibility for the series. And I think it's working. There are a number of people who say, well, I don't know if I'm going to come see that because I don't know it. My feeling is, well, trust us, take a chance, look at our track record, look at the things you've seen here and loved, and assume that we wouldn't do this if it wasn't worth doing. No, I think that's right. I mean, it, would, it seemed to me that a, sh a show that you haven't only maybe barely heard of, and that, that would be exactly what would, you'd come to as the Mufti series for. I know a fair amount of shows, I, I'm um, happy to say, and I'm, I had heard of it, but I didn't know it. I, the same for me. And so it was a great discovery for both of us, and it really has to do with it coming out on CD last year on the Kritzerland label, and uh, our board member, Frank Skillern, brought it to me. He's right. been a major fan of it for years, and he said, this would make a good Mufti, and he handed me a CD. And then I had a meeting with you, sat in your office, and you played the CD, and How Green Was My Valley was the, the, the song you played, and I, fell really instantly in love. I said, oh, well, that's, that's terrific. And then the rest of the score is also uh, absolutely as rich. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah, it would have been awkward if that was the only good song. It would have been very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Not a pleasant week of rehearsal, but quite the, op quite the opposite, quite the opposite. But um, we've had lots of wonderful discoveries in, in the 20 shows that you've done. Uh, Time for Singing is the 99th show in our Mufti series, which is amazing right there. How many years is it, actually? 20 so, years. 20 years. Oh, wow. 1994 we started, so yeah. 2014 is 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, but you've done all sorts of wonderful things, Some, uh, many of which you knew and were excited to visit. That's right. Even yeah. in this concert. Take me along, that, certainly, in a case. It's a in wonderful time. production. But Darling of the Day, I, I, which was the first one I did, that was a discovery. I mean, I hadn't known of Darling of the Day, and, uh, the, and I had vaguely heard the cast album, the original cast album, uh -huh. but I didn't really know the show. And then, uh, be because I knew Dina Rosenberg, uh, 
uh, who is uh, Yip Harburg's uh, daughter-in-law. Just for a, a sidebar, Darling of the Day is written by Julie Stein, Yip Harburg, and Nunnally Johnson. And uh, it had a rocky Broadway production in 1968, yeah, I believe. Yeah, rockier than, than oh, a time for much singing. Rockier. Yeah. yeah, and it lasted less, less. long, uh, a short, and had a shorter run than uh, time for singing. But Patricia Rutledge won the Tony for That's it. correct. So it, Her male lead was Vincent Price, and uh, Margaret Stein, Julie's widow, um, said, yeah, the problem with casting him in a romantic lead was you thought he was going to kill Patricia Rutledge anywhere, anytime he came near her. Because, because of his of history. The, with, the Hammer film series yes, that he did. All yes. the horror movies. Nothing, nothing nefarious, yes. really. No, it. no, they got along fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there were like four different directors on the way to Broadway and three different book writers, and it opened without a book writer being credited. Um, and Vincent Price, not really a, a singer. And, right. And he had a lot of songs. Yeah, that, uh, wonderful songs. Yeah. A wonderful score, as delightful it, score. As it turned out, be, because we did it twice. Didn't we did we? it twice. It's one of the three shows that we've done twice in the Mufti series. And actually, I was going to repeat it again this time for the 100th series. And uh, a number of people, you too maybe, uh, said great to repeat things, but there's still so many wonderful shows you haven't done, why, why repeat? Right. And that was a very interesting, uh, useful idea. Although I would happily ideas. do Darling again, because it, it, it is a Darling. What I'd love to do is a full production of it. It deserves that. Would be great. that. Yeah. If yeah. we could get the cast, that any of the casts that we've had, either of the casts that we have had, uh, yeah. it would be wonderful. But or other ones. Well, they were people extraordinary too. people. Yeah. Rebecca Luker and Simon Jones yes. and Beth Fowler and yeah. Mo Hannon. You do, it doesn't Not get too bad. much better. No. no, no, that's true. But what are other shows that you remember fondly from uh, your from the, from the Matis? One of the ones I remember. I'm just going to throw out is "Wish You Were Here." I'm I a love big Harold Rome fan. Me, me too. And you did such a beautiful job with suggesting. I, <laughs> There's the whole swimming pool scene. Well, that was that was fun. That you did with a bolt of bolt blue cloth. No, because we, you know, that was the whole no notoriety of Wish You Were Here. That it was the musical with the swimming pool, right. and that they built it in the it was in the, the orchestra, orchestra pit, pit. Yeah. of the Imperial Theater. And so you know, well, we felt we just gotta have a swimming pool. So right here, and it ends the first act with it with. Uh, people being thrown into the swimming pool. So um, what we did, it, uh, we had a bolt of blue cloth thrown across the entire front of the stage, just down one step, and then people were jump, jumped off and landed right on, what is it, uh, six inches below, yes. and, they were in, and they were in the pool. And it was. And we believe it was. That's the great thing well, about the Well, it was Muffies. silly, but it yes. was. But it was. It was yeah, great. It was a fun. wink, uh, a, a nod to the reality of what it was, and it was an acknowledgement that we had to have a swimming pool. Yeah, <laughs> and that we were doing what we could yes. in five days. Yeah. Um, but you've sort of become a master of of uh, pulling these things together calmly. Uh, well, uh, uh, no, well. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not sure about the adjective. <laughs> well, you're you're the ultimate. You're ever. calm, yeah. and and uh, which helps it work. It it comes down from the top, and by the director being in comfortable control uh, throughout the process, it makes everyone else calmer, and even people who've never done it before believe that it's going to happen. That's a big part of it. People who, have, particularly the people who've never done one of these before having the faith that, yes, this will come together. We have a paying audience in two days, and it doesn't look like it now, but I just trust that this guy knows what he's doing. And I think that you exude trust. Oh, well, that's, that's truly lovely to hear. But, uh, you know, it's, it's also people's determination to get it on. I remember the, the, the Friday uh, afternoon when we were just, and the Wish You Were Here was one where we had somehow just got to the end of Friday and got it all on the stage, just in Without time. a run through. Without a run through. So the and, first run through was. And Perry Ojeda, uh, who was playing Chick, the, the, the uh, lead in Wish You Were Here, said, 
We are gods of musical theater. <laughs> and, <I'd forgotten> that. <laughs> yes. and I think I think people get to feel like that. Yeah, because, because impossible doing things. the impossible. Yeah, right. every day. Yeah. Like, right. um, other wonderful memories. I remember the girl who came to supper, which oh. introduced us to Nancy Anderson and Celeste oh. Holmes. Oh, and Celeste. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you yes. uh, my favorite Celeste Holmes story, who, who, I, who I really adored. We, a girl who came to supper, that was another tough rehearsal period because during that week was, you remember Hurricane Floyd? That was, oh, and the mayor, yeah. the mayor announced on the radio that all concerns and good citizens should stay at home and not go out. And some people who live not very near the theater at all said, I don't think we can come into rehearsal today. Uh, and so fortunately we had Simon Jones here, and uh, again Simon Jones, who's a, a, a joy to work with, and Nancy Anderson likewise, and Mo Hannon, uh, all of us who had worked before. Well, they got here. And remember I said, because th and this is such uh, an impossible request to, to, be, to have made to you, uh, be, be given, given our budgets, because it was teeming and windy, as it would be in a hurricane. And I said, do you think we could, we could get a car to pick Celeste up so she can get to rehearsal because we felt that she did want to come? And you took a very deep breath and said, yes, and tried to call her, but there was no answer. And uh, so we thought, oh, well, maybe she's taken shelter somewhere. Anyway, so Nancy and Mo and uh, Simon and I, and, uh, and Jimmy, Jimmy Roberts, that lovely oh, composer right, who was our musical director, he yeah. got here. So we were doing whatever we could, which is considerable because they had a lot of big numbers, but nevertheless, it wasn't the whole show. And all of a sudden, about, we were working for about an hour or so, and that door opened, and in came Celeste, dripping, literally dripping wet. And I said, oh my God, Celeste, you're soaked. And I went to help her off with her, her coat, and that was soaked through. So uh, as it turned out, I, I had an extra pair of dry socks, which uh, my wife had stuffed into to my, my shoulder bag. And I said, oh, let's, let's get you into something. So they rummaged into, in the, in the wardrobe, such as it is here. And so Celeste Holm had a, a, some pair of slacks, a t-shirt, my second pair of socks, and I think my, my baseball jacket wrapped around, and proceeded to rehearse the Grand Duchess in The Girl Who Came to Supper. And no one ever looked more regal than Celeste did. But she said, when she came in dripping, this is, and this is really the point of the story, she said, I couldn't get a cab, so I walked. Oh, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. One of, one That's of, amazing. That one of, from Central Park West. From here. Central Park West in the 60s. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, another great. She should have been working for the post office. Yes, yes. <laughs> Another great memory of mine uh, out of your canon is uh, Johnny Johnson. I, I, was, uh, I was going to, yeah, I, I, I adore that. Where I, I'm a huge Kurt Weill fan, and, and uh, I knew Johnny Johnson from the, the old MGM recording of it. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I loved it. And then we discovered more and more music that we restored in it. There, were, had, there was a recording out, I've forgotten who, who made that, uh, a CD, and it had more music than was on the MGM. Anyway, we got hold of the, the, the score. So, I think the Kurt uh, Weill Foundation was they were very, 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 very supportive. And each piece that we got was, was, was an absolute thrill. And uh, it, was, it was beautifully played and beautifully sung and, and it was a genuine thrill of discovery, for, I think, with the, everyone who was in it. I mean, it's interesting uh, because the Kurt Weill Foundation normally doesn't allow productions of his shows 
without the full orchestration. Right. But because this is done so rarely, and we had such a, um, a track record of quality presentations, they let us do it. And what was interesting, we, you know, for years we've not allowed reviews of our shows in the Mufti series. And uh, because just the amount of time involved in putting them up, I don't think it's fair to either the actors or the material to have people come in and review it after four and a half days of rehearsal. Right. No, and, they're, they're but they sent a reviewer without us knowing it. Do you remember this? And Larry, uh, Larry Lash, was it? Uh, oh, yeah. I think yeah. so. Well, it was and a good review, so it was you tend to Ray, remember that. It was a Ray <laughs> review in their newsletter. It came out several months later, but yeah. it was just a glowing review. And so for years, I said, when people would ask if they could review a Mufti performance, I would say, yes, but it has to be totally positive. There can be nothing negative in it. So if you review it, you're reviewing it under that. Now with this new setup, we can allow reviews. Yes, indeed. Which, well, which well, makes a big difference we'll in terms of visibility, in terms of getting word out about the subject, uh, the series. But I do want to say one, one more thing about Johnny Johnson and why I think it, it worked so well. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece. It's an anti-war piece. It was one of the original productions of the, the group theater back in the 30s. And they had an incredible cast. I mean, I think Kazan was in it. And, uh, uh, yeah. and Aunt Burgess Meredith. Burgess Meredith. Uh, fabulous people. None of them particularly noted for their singing ability. Uh, however, however, uh, much genius there was in, in other aspects of their career. And then I think it, it was revived again, uh, in, in the, not revived again, revived, uh, where in the 50s or 60s that Jose Quintero directed, and that didn't last very long. Yeah. Now there's a lot of text to it because it's written by Paul Green, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, and it's an impassioned text, just as impassioned as the music. But it's the music that really uh, gets to the, the, the heart and, and the depth of feeling uh, that's really on an extraordinary level and, and, and illuminates the text. And I, I think the piece had never had such a cast of singers uh, uh -huh. doing it. So that was a wonderful thing to, to be able to, to do uh, and to have the piece rediscovered, however briefly it was at that time. I think it's a piece that could, could e easily be done again. I but, agree. But I agree. It's a big cast, of course. It's a big cast. The other thing is that the original production and a full production would normally be a sprawling uh, physical production would need to be. There are gigantic guns on the battlefield and, right. and all sorts of fascinating places we go to scenically. But doing it on a bare stage, I think, opened it up, uh, made it less clunky, made it less cumbersome. Well, when that's, well that's the magic of the Muftis, if it, that, you, that you strip it down to the bones and more often than not, the pieces that you've chosen to do are, are really wonderful pieces, particularly when things that may have been deemed absolutely essential to get the piece on have been stripped away, and then you see what the piece really is. And more often than, than, than not, it's, it's really shown itself to be a, a really viable theatrically. And, and, interesting and intriguing and I think the process of doing that is also what, what interests the audience here uh, perhaps maybe even unwittingly sometimes but when they see people or uh, change their their character from one scene to another when they are swept from one locale to another just like and, and all that's done to paint that is somebody saying, where we happen to be at this very right. moment. And actually, no show uh, has done that more than A Time for Singing, because I think there are more scene changes uh, in A Time for Singing than in any of the shows I've, I've done. And it's just really 
just what <laughs> one of the wonderful essences of theater to see that, that somebody takes two steps over there and say, well, now I'm in the mine. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody else goes uh, across the street, well, we're in the village square, and a step over, and then they're in a totally other place. But what's even more wonderful is that they, they act that. They act that. By attitude, by... Well, osmosis. Well, if we know they are in the mind. They believe it. Yeah, they believe they it. They believe it. We believe so it. So people can believe it. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. And I think people who've never experienced it before in the audience, from the audience point of view, may think. I've heard a lot of people say, "I don't want to go see a reading." Yeah. I don't want to see people holding scripts. But the amazing thing is, after five minutes, you completely forget, forget the scripts forget are there. They're holding the quality them. of the actors, the talent of the actors that we can get here, who love doing these shows. Uh, well, that's such that they make you forget the script. But you always so wisely say at the outset, do not pretend that you don't have the script in your hand. And I think that because you'll run into trouble if, if you suddenly th uh, think, oh, I've been doing this for the uh, extraordinary length of three days now and I can just start acting it. Well, as you, as you say, you, you really can't because in the heat of performance sometimes you forget where the, the, the next moment the is. The danger is when instinct takes over and they say, I'm, I have to relate to my other actors, it's rude not to, and the audience will not get a full performance from me if I don't get my head out of the book, and that's when the mistakes happen. Right. And people forget that the first time they're out on stage in a mufti, and so I always remind them of it, just it's, it's a great thing to think about. The other great aspect of that kind of discovery is that when the actor is using the script as, as part of the performance and not trying to pretend that that's not happening, it becomes part of the performance and gets totally erased, I think, in people watching it. As you say, they, they, they forget that they're watching somebody uh, hold the script. Even if somebody turns a page, if they're doing it as the character, somehow uh, the, the, the script vanishes. Yeah. I mean, after five yeah. minutes anyway. Uh, and, and, and it takes off, it floats, yeah. free of the page. You know, another of your shows that I remember very fondly for its complete lack of uh, production values <laughs> that, that took us everywhere we needed to go by sheer force of talent and will was I and Albert by Charles Strauss and Lee Adams. Nancy Anderson Another played... Another gorgeous performance by Nancy. Yeah, yeah Nancy Anderson. played Queen Victoria from age 17 to age 81 or something like that. And, and in the original production, who was... Uh, 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 oh, no, Patricia Rutledge was, was yeah. uh, in... Uh, that was the, the Shire and Maltby yeah. piece. Uh, that was we'll also about that. Queen Victoria. Uh, um, the original production, the woman who played the lead, uh, it, was, it, it had only been done in London. We were the New York premiere. We were the American premiere of it. Sven and Bertolt Taub was, 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 was Albert, I Albert. remember. Uh, and so let me think. We'll, we'll come to we'll, it. We'll think of it. But anyway, much beautiful costuming and makeup, wigs, as she aged over the years. And stunning pictures of these costumes, how they changed through the course of the show to show her, the periods changing, her changing, and all of that. Nancy did it in one costume, no change in makeup the entire time. She may have put a shawl on it. Oh, she had a, a black veil, veil, which she, of course, lifted off right. her face pretty quickly on. But that was it. But it and was because she aged from the inside out. It was an amazing <laughs> performance that I'll never forget. And this is book in hand in five days of rehearsal, and it was glorious. Um, just one of the many moments of Mufti magic, uh, <laughs> to be a, a little alliterative. A um, what are others that you remember? Well, there were, there were moments, I mean, the, the, for instance, the, in The Man with the Load of Mischief, there was a banquet scene. And I think uh, Holly Holcomb, who was the serving girl, uh, we they were we had two can, uh, candelabra on stage, right? And Holly Holcomb came in and held a vase of flowers in what would have been 
the center of, of the table. There was no table. There was just somebody seated at one end and somebody seated at the other and two candelabra behind. And she held the bowl of flowers. And I remember that the, was it. The, the office came up and said, Mike, I thought, how did you do that? How, how did you get the whole scene on stage? And, and that all that, that's all it was, was, was someone holding a bowl of flowers. That, and of course, the actor's belief that they were at a banquet, that's, that's a large part of it. Yeah, and I, it's like the table scene in, in Time for Singing, which is just a V-shaped row of chairs, but you totally believe. You totally believe. And it has to be a V-shape, so you could you can see, see everybody. Yeah, see, yeah. See. But, but it's... But what's also terrific about that, when the boys leave home, when the Morgan brothers leave home because of the, uh, an argument with their father, uh, they take their chair away. So it, it, that, that is a scenic effect because all of a sudden there hadn't been anything on stage. Then there were these two rows of chairs and the father is left alone at the head of the table and his wife and daughters are are there, and they're facing a row of empty space where the chairs had been, as well as the the, the guys sitting in them. But it's 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 a logistical necessity because you can't have people come on stage and just remove the chairs. Mm -hmm. So it, but it works on so many levels. It it clears the stage, which needs to happen, but also it's wonderfully symbolic. Well, the, the, he and the father just said, "Take your clothes and get out." Well, they don't take their clothes because I mean, or you, well, we think they might, but they take their chair from the yeah. dinner table because yeah. they're no longer going to be able to sit there. Yeah, it's things like that that are just magic. It's it's exciting in its simplicity and its its uh, depth of. Well, I think it excites the audience because uh -huh. they they're filling in. The, they see the whole table. They see the whole meal. They see they they, they see the. The, the effect of the desertion. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, we put people's mind to work, I think, in, in absolutely the right way, in the way that takes them out of themselves. And they do, now I'm saying this to a scene designer, but they do the, the, the set design. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's true. I, uh, as a set designer, I have looked at these shows many, many times and said, God, it's so much better with nothing. <laughs> and particularly these shows that had problematic first productions that are famous, that were famously problematic. And many of them had to do with, for whatever reason, a wrong-headed production design, maybe the wrong director, maybe the wrong theater. Uh, or maybe too much. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the, and just when, you, when you're able to strip it all away and hear just the material and look at just the material and let your, audi let your audience's imagination supply everything. And it's a different, you're seeing a different show than I am. Right. But it's all because of our imagination coming into play. Yes. And it's, it's not the situation where we're in so much on Broadway and in big commercial productions nowadays where everything is spelled out for fear that we are not smart enough to get it without it being spelled out. And, and it makes you think. And I think people love that. They also love the fact that there are no microphones. Yes. That's, that that that's, they may not be able to sit back and just have it wash over them. They may actually have to lean forward and listen. But people appreciate yes, that. Yes, remember that leaning forward so you would catch every word? Yeah. Yeah, you don't really have to do that, except you do here, I think, Yeah. a bit. Uh, but the other thing, of course, that we're not saying it, that we do supply, that you have supplied for us is, is the lighting design. And makes a big that's, difference. A, 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 that's a huge difference. I don't supply it, but well, we have wonderful designers. We, well, you supply uh, the wonderful yeah. designers. In this case, and Brian Nason. Brian Nason, most particularly this, this week, has just done absolutely magical work. So there, there, is, there is a guide to transformation that way and to, and to uh, a guide to the mood, a guide, and an enrichment of, of the music, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's, that's very, very important. One of the simpler shows that you did, because it is a review, um, is it the oh, only okay, review you did? Oh, Yeah, right. It was and only three, joyful. Three people, well, four, yeah. with, 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 with Greg the Pliska at yes. the piano. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was in a total state of amazement at only <laughs> having three people to, to, 
to worry about where they were going to be. Uh, and, and almost no dialogue. Almost little bits of little dialogue. Bit, well, little bits together. of dialogue. Wonderful show. Little, and it was, it was a two-show series celebrating shows that had been done in the new theater, which used to be course, on this site. On this very site. And uh, The Mad Show and O Coward. But O Coward is one of my favorite shows ever. Well, I saw it originally. I'm sure you have similar feelings. I saw it originally. Yes, I, well, I'm very oh, fond of oh, O Coward's work. And I, and we, had a, we all had a great time. And a great it. cast. Uh, K.T. Sullivan, Peter Land, and Jim Stanek, and Greg Pliska at the piano. It was very nice. It was very, and, and, and not, Necessarily, everybody. Well, Peter, of course, you'd say uh, a natural for Noel Coward, but uh, and KT. Well, of course, as I didn't know it at the time, but she is quite a devotee of, of Coward's and yeah. very knowledgeable. But interesting, interestingly, Jim Stanek didn't know. Didn't uh, know. maybe knew one song. Maybe uh, had not been exposed to Coward, so it was a but wonderful. He loved, he loved it and and did it like a trooper, like he'd been doing it all his life, yeah. which is what these people do. They throw themselves into it with passion and total commitment. And that's, that's what makes a mufti. <laughs> um, are there, I'm curious, as a director with a significant career at many different levels and at many different venues around the country, has your experience with the muftis changed your approach to directing a show anywhere? Even yeah. a full production. Yeah, I tend to want, like to strip away as much as possible. I mean, really get to the essentials. And, and uh, I've done Sweeney Todd three times now, and each time it, it, it's a little more but a little less at the same time, I think. Uh, Interesting. Uh, and I think that's partially my Mufti training. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think it. The idea is always to, to, to get to what the essence of it uh, is and, and what do you really need. And if you don't really need it, you're probably better off without it. Uh, and like to, the words and the music tell you what you need, really. Uh, I, re I remember yeah. Mama is another case in point because that had lots of big scene changes, and I think. The bones of that, it didn't work on Broadway, un unhappily, no. but, the, but I think we adored doing it. And the, I think the audience... I loved was, it. I loved it. And, it, and it, Marty Charnin, who, who wrote it, with, along with Richard Rogers, was, with, was, seemed to be very pleased with it. Very happy. And in fact, that he, he sort of had been, had lived across the country for a while and did, had done several things with us in pa prior right. years. That brought him back to us. He got very excited about that and the possibility of that. Now, after that came Two by Two, which we did two years later. That's right. That he directed, but another Richard Rogers piece that he'd written with Mr. Rogers, and um, it it was the one one of the wonderful things that has happened out of all of these things are the connections that we have made with writers, with pieces, yeah. with actors, um, and directors such as you. Um, are there shows? that you would love to explore in the Maftis? I know one that you've mentioned to me several times. Which one? The Girl in Pink Tights. Oh, the girl, that's indeed what I was going to say. Well, yeah. my, my wife's uh, uncle uh, oh, uh, the, was the author of the book, but it's, it's a lovely Sigmund Romberg score. And it's, again, it's a huge production, but I think you could, their way of simplifying it. And it's about the theater and about dance, and. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's due for a rediscovery. I totally agree. And I also love Seventeen, as you remember. Yeah, uh, both of those I would love to do um, and are perfect choices for you. They're, I mean, it's also interesting getting to know directors. Um, when I heard A Time for Singing, I just thought immediately of you. Not that huh. there aren't other directors who could do it, but huh. out of our group of directors that I've worked regularly with, I, I heard it and thought, I'm going to take it to you first. Happily, you responded, I'm very and also for for it to be your twentieth show, it just seemed. It 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 seems like a wonderful choice. I'm I'm really glad that you asked. Well, I I am too. Thank you, Michael, very much. Such for a pleasure. A great pleasure. Look forward to twenty more.
<laughs> well, maybe that may be too much. Maybe. <laughs> or just a little around the edges. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.